you got a line of 75 guys count off by fours one two three four one two three four one two three four five and man did that person have said five he had a bad day instead of protecting them it was more about addressing the feelings and teaching kids to self-advocate you can tell somebody i don't want to be your partner by not saying anything when you walk right past them you just told that person i do not want to be your partner yeah. how does that make you feel and we're not here for you we're here for us right welcome physical educators this is thinking pe because fayette is more than just fun and games i'm stacy nelson and i'm jamie seneca and it's our goal to dig deeper beyond the activities that make your class awesome. So buckle up and join us on this journey. Hey, welcome to another edition of Thinking PE. Stacy, it's Thinking PE time. What are you thinking? Well, Jimmy, we're, uh, we're back in the gym. We've been back full time now for over a month. And I was just doing an activity where we were partnering some uh, students up and I realized we had not a number of kids and there was that one kid that inevitably ended up last. And I went over them and helped them get into a group and not a, not a major deal, but I did start thinking about that. What, what, what's it like to be that last kid? And for sometimes it's not a big deal, but for some kids, you know, maybe, maybe it's a big deal. And I started thinking maybe I can improve my way of partnering people up. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about. Well, what's it like being that last kid or can I improve my uh, teaching here in, in some way? Any thoughts? So in this latest jam session, we had an opportunity to talk with Justin Black, teacher of the year from New Mexico. I, I think it was, a, it was a really good jam session because it, number one, we got a lot, of, a lot of different just strategies on how to find, if you need to get partners, partner students up, some pretty, pretty unique ways to find partners. I picked up a couple of them yep. that I never heard before. but. With the, with the philosophy of thinking PE is what I liked what we did is we took some of these strategies and then just dissected them into the why. Why do we do certain things? Because everything, we'll, we'll just, just for conversation, we'll just call it good and bad. Everything has a good and a bad. There's, mm -hmm. there's something for everything that, that you gain, you have to sacrifice something as well. And that's really what came out of this partner, partnering discussion. Yeah, it was really interesting to go back and listen to it. I didn't grasp it all even as we were talking but as we went back and listened to the recording it it, it did kind of come down to three things we pick, picked apart um and the the first one was a lot of these things we do we do because we, we're trying to protect students uh feelings i, I was going to phrase it that way that yeah. we, we don't want that kid to feel bad that they're that last person and so we will design things using cards maybe presetting the, the groups or the teams or the partners, or you'll do stuff like that. So nobody is last. And so nobody, no, nobody does feel left, left out. So that's one, one thought is protecting those kids. But then another part of this discussion really became interesting to me where it was more, instead of protecting them, it was more about addressing the feelings and teaching kids to self-advocate Teaching kids, you know, um, it came up that we were more setting a culture that it's okay if you're finding your own partner and you're not the first one to find a partner. You, here's the skill you use. You raise your hand, you do this, um, you different techniques. So, so it went from protecting students to addressing those feelings directly. And then the third thing was you have to weigh all that out with the efficiency of your class. Sometimes you just need kids for the time's sake, you need kids to partner up and partner up now. And so weigh all those three things out and that's kind of how we make our decisions. Yeah, so in this first section, that's we're gonna, we're gonna highlight that, that first part there you talked about, protecting kids' emotions. And we'll dig deeper into what that looks like and some different strategies and techniques that were, that were utilized to uh, really, really focus on protecting those emotions. All right, let's take a listen. The first one I'll knock out there is I've got two uh, two decks of cards, and on the cards I actually took a, a sharpie and wrote the letters the, the letters of the alphabet. So with the younger kiddos, especially with kindergarten, when they're learning their letters, that's a good activity, you know, just to hand out the cards and and uh, so I've got one deck, I've got one deck where it's both capital letters for kindergarten early in the year, and then I've also got another set of decks where it's capital letters and then the lowercase letters, so that they have to match their partners. So you take the time to hand a card out to each yep. student. Hand, hand a card out to each student, and then they have to find their partner. When they find their partner, they bring me back the cards. So it is it is somewhat time consuming, but it's a kind of a 
a great way to introduce some of that literature, especially in, in kindergarten and uh, first grade. So time-wise, two minutes? Yeah. Get a class. Yeah. So, I mean, when you say time consuming, it's not overwhelming. No. But, and it's like it's anything, it's as you, as you build that in, then it becomes more, more, more fluid as, as the more times you do it. Yeah. That makes sense. What do you so, think, Justin? What do you, what do you do or... So with my younger groups, I usually do a lot more of picking their groups for them. And sometimes I'll just do random numbers. So like all of my kids have an assigned spot in the gym yep. that has a number. And so I can go two and eight, you're together, 12 and 13, you're together, 14, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, but as they get older, I start to push a lot more of, you need to learn how to pick your own partners. And we, we actually early on spend a lot of time talking about that either at the beginning and or at the end of a session about, did you pick a good partner? Mm -hmm. Were you able to get your activity performed today at the appropriate level? Or did your partner distract you from being able to get done? <laughs> you know, and so... But that's that, it's a skill set, right? That right. They need to learn how to interact with others. And sometimes my best buddy may not always be the best person for getting my work done. Quite often, that could be the case. That's right. <laughs> yeah, those are um, interesting things. Both take some time. Like you're saying, Justin, if you're going to take time at the end of class to talk about, did you pick a good partner? I mean, you can say what you want. It's just, 30 seconds a minute, it, those ads up in class time. Uh, if you're a PE teacher or any teacher, you know that those time, that time is valuable. You just have to look at where you value. And if it's of high enough value, you do it. And, and the nice thing for me is I have the kids the whole time. I don't have another PE teacher that's going to teach them later mm -hmm. yeah. that we have to have an agreement on philosophy or theory. Yep. And so yeah. I gain that time back later because we don't have to deal with the partner issue as yeah. much yeah if you deal with it early on and teach them how to do that yeah so even next year yeah you, get, you gain it because of because of that yeah so jamie what do you like about what you described the handing out cards and then maybe what do you not like as much and, and why why would you pick that over or maybe give that up to do a different kind of partnering um what i what i do like about it especially and I can do it. I do it also with the older kids and use math problems where I would have three times four on one card and 12 on the other card. So they've got to, they've got to solve that. It's just, it's just a way to introduce some of the math and reading into, into, uh, into phi ed. Um, what I, what I do like about it, I can also, if I'm quick enough with the cards, I can strategically pair up students. Okay. Um, <laughs> the downside of it though, is all of a sudden I have, you know, if I'm too quick with the cards, I've got somebody that doesn't have a partner or partners that don't match. So it, that, that gets kind of cumbersome at times, okay. but I say oh, overall, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a fun way for kids to find their partners. But like I say there again, it, it is, it is more time consuming than just saying you to our partners, you to our partners, you to our partners, but it's, it's just something different. Okay. Yeah. And I say, it's not something I use exclusively. Right. It's just a, you know, a random thing I'll throw in once in a while. So I have done the cards where we give them out and this is usually a, we're working on, getting in groups, but changing our groups multiple times. <clears throat> and so I'll give them the cards and I'll tell them, okay, you need to find a partner using the numbers on your cards that gets you the closest to say eight. Now you can have two or three people, but you have to be either right on or close to. Oh, interesting. And then the group that's the farthest way away, they end up having to break up other groups to get the right numbers. Yeah. Okay. So like you have several groups that end up with eight, but you have a group, well, we have 12 is the only way to get it. Well, that means you're going to have to break up. So if there's three of you and you're at 12, but two of you can get you to nine, you can only have a group of two. Now, if we have another group that their number is eight and you only add a couple, that's your new group. Yeah. And so that, that changes that dynamics a little bit of getting them as close to or just under a number. Like you can say, okay, you have to be under as close to eight or under as you can get for your group. 
Interesting. Now they're having to do the math piece that goes with it. And then you do an activity and you go, okay, right quick, find you a new group. Da, 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 da. Here's your new activity. And so now you've introduced that math component of them having to think yeah. when they go in their new groups. So both of these are kind of getting around the question I wanted to ask it about what are you trying to do in getting kids into a group? You know, it seems like both of you are trying to add some other elements, which are wonderful. You know, these activities that really make kids think, you know, or that make kids use their math skills, that make kids use the letter if you're in kindergarten, that, you know, you could do kindergarten, our, our school does different colors per week, you know, or, you know, learning their colors, you could really cross platform um, a, a lot through there. And so that, that seems like something that's above and beyond just partnering up. You guys are really thinking on another level of my, and I would, I would even say in, in the situation, especially with the cards is I'm not too, it is more of a random thing where I'm not too worried about who's partners with who. Right. right. It's just, uh, you know, another one that I saw online, I haven't tried, but it actually caught my, caught my interest to try a quick way to find it. They, it was called to the, the gentleman called the toast again. I wish I could remember his name. Um, but so the kids were all spread out in the gym and the idea was just to get a partner. So say they were, they were dribbling basketballs and, and he, he said, he just blew his whistle, said toast together. And what that was is you, you put your toe, you go toe to toe with the person closest to you. But as you, if you don't have a partner, you start moving towards the center of the gym. And the rule is you don't, you don't walk past anybody that doesn't have a partner. So yeah. I don't go shooting across the gym and pass three people to go be partners with you, Stacy, or to avoid you being your partner, Justin. And, and, and he had that <laughs> conversation where it was like, it, when you can tell somebody, I don't want to be your partner by not saying anything. When you walk right past them, you just told that person, I do not want to be your partner. Yeah. How does that make you feel? So and that, yeah. that was his social emotional piece. And it was a quick way for that, for that, for that teacher for the kids just to find a partner very quickly and also tie in some of that social emotional of, you know, don't yeah. make somebody feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. So we do that with hula hoops. So all the kids have different colored hula hoops and I'll say, okay, you need one color of every hula hoop in your group and you can't have any other, but you have to make it as fast as you can. And I start counting down one, two, three, four, and so you have to find you know, the people that are closest to you. And if somebody's already in that group with your color, you have to go find a new group. But I try really hard when I hand out the hula hoops that I have an equal number. And I have a couple of hula hoops that are multicolored. And so the multicolor can go to any group. Yeah. It's like if I have, we were talking earlier, I have one girl that um, she has issues sometimes with processing and everything else. She always gets a multicolor hula hoop. Okay. Yeah. But, That's a great ad adaptation. Yeah. But the other piece that goes with that is in our standard is you have to learn how to work with others. Right. And in this particular scenario, it's get together, do whatever it is I need you to do, and you're going to go find a new group. How long do you really have to work together? We're not working the whole 45 minutes together. And so then it's as the younger kids learn to do that, as they get older, I can leave them together longer and longer and longer and go, you have to learn today to work with this kid. Yep. And they have to learn to work with you. Yep. You know, and it may be our girl or our boy that is having a hard time today or is having, is a special needs kid. Right. You now need, she's in your group. You guys need to envelop or bring her in and make her part of the group, not go, okay, you're in our group right over there. Right. But that, but that's a skill you have to teach the kids and you need to do it as early as you can. All right, Jamie, obviously you kind of listened to that piece about uh, protecting students from their emotions, from being left out, from being singled out. Any, anything jump out at you there? Well, I think it's a very, 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 very pertinent, very appropriate as well. I mean, you can you hear the stories about the, the student that was picked last over and over again when they were in elementary school and 40, 40 years later, they still talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a real thing. And I think it's really good and it's really smart of teachers to have good strategies, a, a variety of them to be able to get your 
people, your students, where they need to be, whether it's in partners or in groups or to move people without singling people out. I think, I think it, it, the strategies they were talking about using those cards, I think it, it's genius and kids respond well to them. And I think it's just good to have some of those tools in your holster. You know, you, you, the word you use was fair. And I really like that one where like, if I use the cards and I have a capital A and a lowercase a and the kids have to find their partner that it, they find a partner, but it was fair. There was yeah. nobody was left out. Everybody got a partner. And, and that, that word fair keeps coming up. Yeah, I think I, I found that students, for whatever reason, when it's fair like that, or it's random, they respond better like, okay, I got this person that's not my favorite kid in the room, but they just seem to go along with it. Whereas if a teacher, if you put somebody with somebody, they might give you the scoff and then, you know, that look on their face and what they just said to that other kid was, I don't want to be your partner. And I guess it can happen when it happens randomly too. And you might yeah. have to yeah, I mean, I'd have to talk to somebody about that saying, you know, if he gets the capital A and see who's gets then the, the lowercase a, if he goes, ah, oh, he might have to address that. It, that can, that can happen too. I've just found it happens a little less when it's a random thing, kind of like rock, paper, scissors, for whatever reason in the world of PE, that is, that is all powerful. And if you win or lose by that, I guess it, it, there's no arguing. It's just amazing how they just cop to it. And they, they go along with it. You know, it, it's off the subject, but I think it could be onto something here that rock, paper, scissors of solving problems. But instead of doing play uh, replays in the NFL, what if they just rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> <laughs> you know, instead, instead of 15 dissections for, from 12 different angles, yeah, yeah. The, the two players that were involved, they just jump up, do a quick rock, yeah. paper, scissors, and nope, <laughs> that was an incomplete pass. Yeah. So that yeah, got us off track there, but I don't know why that just popped in, into my That's head. That's funny. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have nearly as many commercials. Because it would cut the time frame down so long that, <laughs> that we wouldn't have to True. do all those commercials while they're deliberating over the 12 angles they're looking at from film. So that's, yeah, that was a nice so, digression. You know, but I like it. Ba yeah, back on track though. I, I do, what I did like out of that session is we went, we went through a number of different strategies, just quick, quick ways, you know, of, of ways to find, find partners. And what I, what I liked about was just going through how each one has something different has a different and it kind of goes back to our thinking PE and, and thinking why why are you doing something yeah what's your what's your what's your goal in this it's important i think that's the main thing we keep coming back to is know why you do it i mean when we have student teachers you, you and i we both end up asking that question a lot well that that's a great activity but why did you choose to move the students that way instead of a different way and the biggest thing is it, it's generally not wrong it if you've at least thought through it because you probably have a good reason for what you're doing so yeah i think that's a great statement this uh, there there to me there isn't there isn't a wrong right right or wrong answer here yeah it's the thought process that has gone into it yeah and and i, I really like that you know but let's take a moment for a second here and let's 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 address that giant elephant sitting in the room you've got the you've got the kid that's picked last that like you just said that gets the partner and you get the you get the oh I've, i want partners with with him or her yeah how do we deal with that yeah I, and i love this that's what the big insight to this conversation when we were when we had the jam session was to me it was some teachers approach this totally differently instead of looking for ways to avoid or protect a student like you said they're gonna they're gonna address the elephant in the room and they're gonna use this to teach these sel you know the the student emotional learn learning they're going to address it head on and that's what this next section is about so we'll we'll revisit this after we listen to this section i'd like to talk a little bit about that what um is this something that should be high on our priority to think about is that part of a reason why you use cards and do other things or do we address it like you're talking about justin address it head on or any thoughts any, any thoughts on that so I don't know if this helps or not, but and a prime example of this is coming up in my school in the next couple of weeks when we come back to school. We just had a family move into our community real recently. And we got an email the other day that says one of the kids will not be able to come to PE or go to recess without wearing a helmet because he's got some yeah. brain issue right. of some sort mm -hmm. and he will not put his hands out when he falls oh. 
And yeah. because he has brain issues, he falls down a lot. Oh. So uh, now you have to talk to the kid. So the minute I got that email, I picked it up with our counselor and said, hey, before we get them, are you going to already have a conversation with all of the kids that are going to have interaction with this yeah. kid? And his first comment was, well, why? And I went, let's <laughs> think about this. And I said, you have a kid at recess. All of a sudden it's wearing a helmet. We don't want to make fun of him. We don't right. want to, we want to take care of him. And so in the past at our school, we had a D-level special ed group. So it was part of our culture of our school, but that's been seven years. Yeah, it's gone. So it's not part of our culture anymore. We're going to have to re- put that back into the culture of, yeah. hey, it's okay, bring him into your group and let's treat him like we would anybody else. He just has a helmet on. Yeah. Jamie, you do an interesting thing, or you're starting to, or <laughs> you were going to before COVID. Um, you, you, I, it was the phrase you used about having an emoji safe, Jim. Have, have you putzed with that at all? Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? I mean, that, that is, uh, I mean, that's kind of the I want to say the, the, the hallmark of the gym right now or what kind of our, our, our focus has been emoji safe all year long. And, and that would go into picking partners where, you know, just what I talked about with the toes together, where if you pick a partner, if you walk right by somebody, you're, you're telling them, I don't want to be partner. And that's, right. that's not, that's hurting their feelings. So that's not emoji safe. And so do you talk more about it than that? Or do you just make a rule or how do you have these conversations with K through five, let, let's say, and I know there's other listeners that are, you know, high school teachers and whatnot. Let's, let's focus for a minute on the K through five angle. Well, it has, it has less to do with the, with the partnering other than, other than that example, but we just started basketball right now. So and dribbling in, in K and one, and one of the things we talk about is like, kids are trying something, I'm getting new challenges and you're saying that's easy. And yeah. it may be easy, but for some people it might be challenging. So if, if I, if I'm struggling with, with, uh, with a certain dribbling activity, but five people around me are saying how easy it is, how's that make me feel? Okay. So anyway, it's just something we talk about is when kids blurt out, that's easy. They're not trying to be mean, but you have to understand how somebody else might interpret yeah. that. You know, and the example I given for basketball with fifth, with uh, the third, fourth and fifth graders was if somebody shoots an air ball yep. and you laugh at them, you just ruin their basketball experience. And, and now they're going to be, we just not, we, in that instant, we just created an environment where it's not okay to make a mistake yeah. because now the kids are going to feel they're, they're going to be afraid to try new things. Where if you shoot an air ball and somebody hands you another basketball and tells you to try again, and you shoot another air ball and another one and another one. And, I, and what I talk about is imagine if somebody shot 50 air balls in the row and then they finally made it and you celebrate with them, yeah. how, how much different that environment has created. Okay. And that's what we talk about when we talk about being emoji safe. So, we, we really highlight it at the beginning of the year. And then just as it comes up, it's teachable moments throughout the course of every unit that we do. So once again, you're thinking, here's the main thing I want to get across. And you have to sacrifice time because it, it takes time to have those conversations, but you, mm -hmm. you value that enough this year. And I'm from the tone in your voice, it feels like it's going well enough. You're going to kind of incorporate that. Would you, would you say that? Right, if, and I think it's kind of like Justin was talking about with, with, with picking the correct partners is you put in that initial investment of time yep. and then it pays itself. And then it pays the interest, the interest in that investment pays off. Yeah. So you don't have to have that every year as long because some of those kids had you mm -hmm. the year before or have been in that environment. So now it you're becomes, just kind of training in the kindergartners. In, like in like, the first like Jess was saying, it's, it's creating a culture. Yeah. You're creating a culture of picking partners and picking the correct partners because your best friend might not be your best partner to get your work done. And we, we create that culture with emoji safe. Okay. Yeah. We use family. Say more. They're, they're part of our family. Gotcha. They are not that person over there. Okay. And your job is to constantly invite them and make them comfortable within our family. And that's the culture we're trying to drive constantly, constantly, constantly. So like, you know, you may be really good at this. Great. Help the kid that's having a hard time then. Because that's your job is to help the family. <laughs> it's not isolate out. Yeah. But, that, but that's a culture you have to spend time cultivating 
And yeah. it does help if your entire family in this aspect, the entire school, yeah. that's their goal. Yeah. And it's nice that for a lot of PE teachers at the elementary, you're able to see all the kids. Yeah. Or at least a huge percentage of them. I know, Jamie, between the two of you, your teachers, mm -hmm. you see all of them. And so you got two people. It's on a rotating basis, but you see all the kids. So you can infuse that culture in all of your classes. And that kind of goes school wide at that point. Not only do you see the, all, all the kids, you see all the kids for six years in most cases. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I've been a high school PE teacher and I've been a high school coach. And, and I'll tell you right now, it works the best when everybody's on the same page. And, and I get a kick out of this one myself. And I do it with my older groups more than I do with my younger groups because I don't let them have as much autonomy. But I'll let them pick their groups and then I'll go in and take their groups apart. Okay, and I, and I go, you know, I think I need to make some changes because things are going to work better. And, and I won't move one kid or two kids. I'm moving four or five kids. Okay. And so it's not obvious that I need to get you out of this group. Okay. I'm going to start with, I'm going to move this kid over here because that looks, that works better. Or I'll move this kid over here and then I can move this one over there because now we have a more level group. Okay. Group. And so you use some of those terminologies of why you're trying to do what you're doing. But we talk about those things all the time. Like um, one of the things that I will never do intentionally on my end is I never put the two best kids together in a group. You know, Even if it's, it's just partners, partners playing catch or warming up their arms? Pretty rarely because I want those kids to interact because they're going to be who, when they go to recess, that's who they're going to play with. Mm -hmm. When they go do something, that's who they're going to play with. And I go, I need you to do this a little differently. And we're not here for you. We're here for us. Right. This, what we're talking about is the same K through 12. It looks different in high school. Yeah. You might, you'd have a different conversation. You might not have a public one. You might have a private one. I, I'm thinking if, I, if there's a high school, you might just pull a kid aside and have a more of an adult conversation rather than in elementary, you might stop the whole class and say, let's learn from this, you know, um, or you might, you might do a different, I don't know, but I, I'm just thinking it looks different, but the concept of what we're saying is the same as we're still aware of the kids needs and you're still trying to teach the class how to be empathetic, how to be in tune beyond their notes. You know, to people, <laughs> to, to things that go on beyond six inches in front of them. And I have, um, over time with some of my older kids, pulled them aside at the beginning of class and go, okay, today your job is to help with this scenario yeah, or with this thing that we're going to work on. Yeah. I, I know you're really good at soccer. So when I put you in this group, I'm putting you in this group because I need you to help me with that group yeah you know make it a stronger group don't be upset because oh i have to be with this group no you're my assistant today and so that changes their outlook their change yeah, our, to think about it yeah i sent uh, a while back uh, a note out to a few different professors and different teachers to get some feedback and this came from um christy malley um, she's been on the podcast before. Um, she, she shared quite a few ideas, and I'd like to share some of her um, ideas that she had, kind of like your card ideas and that kind of thing. But she says, looking back, she says, if I was back in the room again, she says, I, I'd be much more focused on creating the culture of ownership, valuing choice, or you know, giving kids choice autonomy and collaboration those are some of the words that that she chose that she says she used a lot of those techniques to avoid that last kid being noticed that you know what i mean you hand out the cards mm -hmm. so that one kid doesn't get singled out and she says i what i'm hearing from her is i think now i'd go back and teach it to the whole class of you know and this is what i do sometimes in my classes i'll just i'll just stop the whole class and just say before we pick partners here or, or groups, I'm going to ask you to get in groups of three. Some of you are 
you know, I have four best friends. I said, how many of you have ever been <laughs> that fourth person that gets left out? Well, almost every kid raises their hand. And that's what I'm trying to do is normalize the fact that number one, we all get left out once in a while. It does happen. And so it's a normal thing if you're, if you're one of the last ones. And I always say then as a teacher, I'm going to come and help at the end. Or somebody recently on one of our podcasts was talking about, they teach them to put their hand up which is advocating for themselves. And here again, I made my head go tilt going, oh, I, as a teacher, I was trying to not let that last kid get left out. That person, I think it was Tom Roberts maybe, that was saying, I teach them to put their hand up because now I look around for other hands up and now the three of us know we need, we all need each other and so we can go meet. And it, rather than saving these kids from it, it's addressing it and showing that it's normal we're all going to be left out from time to time. And when you are, what do you do? Do you just stand there? No, you advocate for yourself. You put your hand up. Everybody, you, you can see other hands that are up. And this becomes the norm. Maybe it was you, Justin. But now that I think about it, were you, were you talking about that? Was, that was you that talked about actually addressing it and teaching it. Yeah, you have to, you have to talk about the elephant in the room. Or that elephant yeah. doesn't go away. That's uh, a good point. Yeah, ra rather than avoid it, you know, and that's what some of the things I was thinking of doing, uh, you know, to have these cards. And not that the cards are bad because you have other reasons for doing those too. But that doesn't help the students in a way where we have a chance here to teach self-advocation. We have a chance to teach autonomy of how, how do I handle this when a teacher's not there or maybe there's a sub that's not going to do a good job of helping me get a partner. I can still learn how. Um, I, I don't know. It just it changed my thinking just a little bit on this because I was looking for ways to avoid it, and now I'm really looking for ways to address the elephant in the room, Justin, like you said, and and use it as a teaching moment. And I don't know. I kind of I, I feel better about it for some reason rather than feel like I'm just trying to make a kid not feel bad. No, number one, normalize it. Number two, advocate for when it does happen and. So, Stacy, what'd you think about that elephant standing over there in the room? What, what was your, uh, what was your big takeaway? Well, I, I guess I'm impressed with teachers that take something like that elephant, something that my natural, in, you know, inclination was to avoid, and they turned it around and turned it into a teaching situation. I, that was probably the overall biggest thing of going, yeah, I, it just made so much sense. It, it fit me, kind of, kind of hit, hit my heart. Going, yeah, I'd much rather. I'd much rather do this. And it was two things, develop a culture where this is okay. It's, this is what happens. And a part of that is that self-advocation where we all need to self-advocate sometimes. If, if you're, there's down to four people left and none of us have partners, we all just stand around. No, we raise our hand or we, you know, go ask somebody to be a partner. I think that's just a good skill to have. And then the other part is that culture that these teachers can develop of, treating people respectfully, you know, Justin talked quite a bit about that, the, the we, not I, and all those other lessons that can, yeah. be, that can be put into them. So I guess those were the two main things that came, um, that stuck out to me. Yeah, I like that. And Justin made a great, great point about you have that student that doesn't have a partner. And normally they just kind of fall back into the shadows, and yeah. disappear. And, and teaching not just that student, but all the students, giving them the tools of what do I do when I don't have a partner? Yeah. And, and to me, that, I mean, that's, that's really what a great physical educator does is provide, provide a safe environment yeah. and a safe opportunity and then practice that. Just like if you were doing shooting yeah. where I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable sh taking this shot, even though I might shoot an air ball because kids aren't going to laugh at me. You're providing that safe environment. It's yeah. the same thing when you open it up to choose a partner and you don't have a partner. Now we, we've created a safe environment. Yeah. We've, we've pre-taught some of those strategies where, okay, this is what I do when I don't have a partner that, and again, it's that self-advocacy piece. Yeah. I, I just, I like the idea and Christine Malley kind of brought it up th that if she were to go back, she would do it maybe a little bit different and really take control of that culture and, and promote more of that. And not that you would never use the cards or we're not really trying to say we wouldn't do it another way, but to do this and use the time to do this, that's the, key, that's the kicker. 
this takes time to develop a culture yeah. that you have to have these discussions. You listen to Justin, a lot of what he says is, yeah, we take time. We talk about that. We take time. We talk about that. We discuss that. Wow. You know, I just feel so much pressure all the time to get kids active that a lot of times I just skip this. And so that's the give and take with all this though. Right. And it, it is a great point. It, it's a return on the investment. You know, we're, we're starting to use, we're using the pedometers in, in, uh, in class and you know, our goal is, you know, see how many steps we can get during class. And that's part of, part of my reflection too, is, you know, when I ask how many kids got 3000 steps today and I look around and nobody's got the, you know, it's like, okay, where they didn't get the activity that they needed. And so I don't want to say that, you know, good and bad, but that is, that is the downside. Like you say, there, it takes time. It takes, it takes that activity time. And I guess I look at it as also the flip side of that it's a return on the investment. If I invest this, this amount, this X amount of minutes or this amount of time to pre-teach some of those things as the year goes on, or as you know, I'll see the kids for six years. So if I'm doing this in kindergarten, first yeah. and second grade, by the time they're fifth graders, I don't have to put that much time into it anymore. Yeah, I think Justin would argue for that being actually more efficient in some ways. You put yeah. the time in early. And you talked about it later, getting the return on investment either further back in the year or in later years that now you've addressed this. Now you can go to really fast getting partners. You can just say, Hey, everybody find a partner and boom, they can do it. And you can trust yeah. that they're not going to, we're not going to hurt these students feelings. And they're not going to be sitting on the counselor's chair when they're 34 years old, talking to their therapist about their PE class. So I, I think there's, there's the discussion there, but in the moment, you still have to make the decision and think through, well, why am I, why am I doing this? What am I really trying to accomplish today? Do I use that strategy? So that kind of leads us into this last section where we talk about, um, really, we do address some really efficient ways to partner kids up. I kind of like some of the things that come up in this session because they're really practical things you can take and use today in your, in your gym class. Let's take a listen. If you just type in, and it's just a random student generator on, on, on a Google search. Uh, hundreds of them will pop up, whether yeah. they're spinning a wheel, shaking a dice. Uh, you know, the downside to that, it looks, I mean, you have to pre-enter the students' names. Right. Um, and but, take out students know, that are absent and, you know. Those and those sorts. So it probably works better for a classroom teacher versus a FIA teacher, but it's just another one of those options. If, if students had student ID numbers, you know, in your yeah. class, I suppose you could do it that way. But it was just kind of a, kind of a, another way just to, if you need random students very quickly yep. to, to pop them up there. Some of the ideas I got from people and that I've thought through um, over the years, you guys could uh, address a little bit of them earlier. Um, if you can have things set up in your gym, like Justin talked about his, each kid has a number. Um, if you have squads and squad one is one through five and then six through 10 is squad two, um, maybe even have colors um, that can be, you know, if you have five different squads and they're all different colors, you have five teams. If you ever need a group, you know, we're getting into groups a little bit more than partnering. But what I was thinking about doing the COVID hit. Um, so next year, I think I'll set up two or three different partner groups in their squads, like squad one and two, the person sitting right next to them, that's going to be your blue group. If I ever say blue partners, that's going to be your blue partner. And those two will be sitting, whoever's sitting right next to you on that side, and then kind of switch it up for the, uh, a red day where it's the person, uh, you know, squads three and four and then one and six or whatever, but kind of have three different ones set up so I can quickly go, okay, you need to find your green partner today. And you'd have to build that in and, and practice that a little bit. And then there's going to be students that are absent, but then it only takes you a second to find a couple mm -hmm. of those that were absent, put those together and they got partners just like that. And again, the, you're avoiding the conversation and the, the person being left out. So you're not addressing it, but at least to do that sometimes for efficiency, it's built in and really quick. I just wanted to toss that idea out um, because those are some of the things that came across on Facebook when I put this out. And I'm hoping this is a resource for people. Justin, you had some? So my groups are in sixes yep. kind of for that reason. So row one and row two, row three, row four. Yep. Right now you have six people in a group. Yep. 
-hmm. but if I turn around and I come to the side of the groups, yeah, now I have A, B, C, D, E, F. Yes. And I only have four rows or four kids in those rows. So now I have groups of four right now. But again, I can go row one and row four, the first two. Yep. Partner, second two, third part, you know, and you go back and those are your partners. Yeah. So because of that numbering system, when they're already there, it's really easy to go find them. And then if I have a kid that's absent, I either make a group of three or I go, do we have two people absent? Okay. Right. You're now, because they both are, don't have a partner yeah. there. There you go. And we're done. And it's super efficient. And you can take, you can fix that at the end in 10 seconds. Or or lots, if, yeah. if there's one or two absences, you can figure it out. And I, I and, I like and it. My kids know their squads. I mean, that's something they have yeah. to know. Yep. The minute they come in every day, they go straight to their squads, which makes it easy for me to do roll call because I just go, oh, 14's absent. And I have it actually gridded on my board. And I just go over and mark 14 absent. And I have a red pin or a blue pin right. or green pin, depending on the class. So yep. that I don't have to do anything else. And then when I get a second, I can come over and go, okay, in my attendance, so-and-so is absent, so-and-so is absent, and it's done. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're going to use those systems when you know you've packed the day full and you want as much time for whatever activity you're going to be doing. You, you don't want to take four minutes for that conversation you were talking about earlier right. about, uh, you know, about the kind of the SEL aspect you just need it to go quick and boom so, so you've got these different, different systems things. in yeah. place so you can be either efficient or you can really be addressing the elephant in the room so to speak from another angle justin or uh, jamie you look like you were going to say something i shut I, oh, I was just uh, i was going to say oh you know pre, when we first came back to school you know we were this this year in person obviously COVID was on everybody's, everybody's mind and contract tracing was, it was a big part for our classroom teachers and seating charts and, and being able to narrow it down. So we went in the event that somebody had to be quarantined, hopefully we won't have to quarantine an entire class. And in, in the gym, we had gym partners where you yeah. literally, when we play catch you, this is your gym partner. You are playing catch with the same person and this might be the rest of the year. We had no idea. And, you know, we explained it to the kids. I mean, it, it wasn't best practices to have the same partner or the same group every single day for every single activity but we explained it to the kids why we were doing it and they, and they responded to it very well. Um, but now, now we've loosened those restrictions slightly where we don't have to have the same partners to play catch with all the time, but we can always go back now and say, Hey, grab your gym partner. Yeah. And they can go right back to their, that's nice. They, they remember their original gym partner from back in, you know, September. So many of these things we're talking about, we talk about that initial setup takes a little time, but you get that time back. I think Justin said it earlier. You, you get it back once you've got those, when you say gym partner and they know who, exactly who to go to, man, that's, that's a time saver and super nice, but it's but not I, great practice to do it the same all the time. So And, and can, it's with, with anything, we can generate a list. It's, it's, it's variety. And I, there isn't one way better than the other for, yeah. you know, I, I suppose in certain situations there is, but overall, it's not a right person, or wrong. There's not a right or wrong, you know, but, and I'm thinking back when I, what I really like what Justin was talking about there with that elephant in the room and how much we, we work to protect that kid from being signaled out instead of teaching the strategies yes. to develop, to develop that, you know, develop that self-confidence, develop that self-esteem and the ability to, you know, to, you know, give, give, give the class as a whole, the strategies to yeah. identify that person. Yeah. So we're doing both. You're identifying the strategies, you're addressing the elephant room, and you've got these other efficient strategies to, to get things done quickly if you need them. And it works kind of both ways there. I, I, and I think like it goes it. to, to know, knowing your students, building relations, you know, it goes back to building relationships and knowing your students. So when that class comes in, when you say get a partner, you already know, that you already know which student is going to struggle. Yeah. Which student is going to fall back into the corner, in, into, the, into the shadows. And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can help that student. Yeah. And we talk about that particular scenario and no one's allowed to go to the corner. And, and, and it makes you feel really great when you finally get those older group that still has the kid that is struggling. Right. Yep. But the other kids go and make them part of their group yes. instead of, oh, okay, 
you know, that, right. that, you know, I've had a couple of kids over the years that go, I got it. And, and be, they already see the kid back in a way and they go, I got him. And they go take care of that kid. Yes. And that feel good. And, and that's where, Hey, there's three of us. I can be with my buddy and we can bring you in. It doesn't have to be me and this other one. And that's where I like groups of three. Yeah. I don't yes. like sub for four. Cause that's that makes pretty it so much easier to have the, the fourth one out. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, depending on what you're doing, you might need right. four, four squares better with four than three, but you know, right. <laughs> four square, you're going to have five. Yeah. Because you want to have a rotation. Yeah. yeah. And, and it obviously works with four too, but right. It's well, nice but it's harder one. for the kids to learn to me if they're always in the game. Yeah. We, we push the concept of even if you're not in the game, you have to pay attention to what's happening. And if they're always in the game, they have no idea how to behave when they're out. Yeah. That's, that's another teaching point there. That's good. I had never, never really thought much about that. And, and teaching. You know, and, and a key uh, part, kind of a, but, but a key part of that is they're not out for very long. Right. You know, there's, there's not opportunity. It, it is that it is part of it. And I absolutely agree. It's, it's accepting that you're out. Yeah. And yeah. the shorter you can make that that amount of time, the easier it is to accept it. Right. And then and then you and then you build on it from there. Yeah, it could be a whole other podcast about it. it absolutely could. I mean, to... way off the subject, but take a tag game. If your tag game, if you have a tag game and you get caught, but you're right back in a couple seconds later, versus if you have a tag game and you're out for ten minutes, yeah. you're gonna have a lot of kids cheating if they're gonna be out for ten minutes. Right. <laughs> it's not fair. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in that exact voice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, I remember, I really I out of that used to go ahead justin well that's what we talk we have kind of like the rock paper scissors we try to teach the kids for recess you had a disagreement fine rock paper scissors yeah <laughs> really do we care who the winner or the loser of this thing is again they do. <laughs> well i know but, but that's what you're trying to teach them is, let's step back a second and let's think about this is it something that's going to cause a life changing event or is it only going to affect you the next couple minutes right right and that's that's a tough distinction for that's certain tough. first graders <laughs> i know so yeah, but that's and, that important piece of you and certain politicians away. that i know that <laughs> just, 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 neither one of you are right neither one of you are wrong but here's where we're moving forward <laughs> and my class sometimes how you know like oh i didn't touch it when it went out of bounds so it's, it's our ball, rock, paper, scissors. Nobody, we're not going to fight over it. Right. We're yeah. not going to spend time I like it. deciding who actually touched it. I guess you did. Rock, paper, scissors, and we're done. Yeah. That, because what's our number one goal? Playing. And the, the beauty of that is the kids accept it as law. Yeah. It's, it's well, amazing to me how many times you tell them to just do paper, rock, scissors, and then they'll be like, and they lose. And they're like, oh, okay. But then they can accept that but they couldn't accept the fact that the other kid was saying, no, you touched it. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. No. But if I lose fair and square on the rock, paper, scissors, paper, scissors it's, it's it, over. God has spoken. And what do you do about it? You know? So I'd like to, I'd like to throw this out there though. So now we have, everybody has partners and just different strategies to all of a sudden change those same partners. And I, I, I want to start one way because the rock, paper, scissors is what, what, trigger my mind is so yeah. everybody's got a partner but now i want to change my partners is the kids do a rock paper scissors if, if you win or if you don't win one, one of them so we'll just say if you win you stand up and then anybody that's if you're if you didn't win you just stay sitting down now anybody that's standing up go sit down next to a new partner and there was just one way to, to switch up the yeah. partner so i'm curious yeah. now that you have partners what strategies do we have that you can you know quickly change partners well that's cool um i didn't really specifically asked that on Facebook. So I didn't get any ideas, but I like um, that. That seems like a real quick way to do it. And anyway, you just uh, single out know, half the group. Yeah. You know, and they'll start to catch on to my tricks. So we were doing, if we're doing basketball with, uh, with, with, with a, with a partner, you know, and they're, they're sitting down next to each other. Say, okay, one person hold the ball. If you're not holding the ball, stand up, right. I'll go move. So then they'll catch on to my tricks. I'll try to get the other. So it's okay. If you have the ball, stand up. <laughs> Yeah. You know, switch, switch it up that way. Try yeah. to play with their minds a little bit. So they're always on their toes. But it's just an, uh, another way to randomly, randomly, you know, switch switch partners. Do you think it's important to add variety like that 
or if you had a certain way or a teacher, let's just say a teacher had a certain way and it worked, could he make, they make the argument to say, why, why mess it up? I just say, do this. And they all know this is the way we switch partners now and, and kind of gain, gaining that time back. Or what, what do you think I, about if, if somebody did it that way? Individual, that argument, I, or? I mean, I know it's a, it's a cliche, but I think it's based on the individual and just the culture you've set in your classroom. Yeah, Some teachers can do that. Uh, personally, me personally, I, I'd have to have the, I have to have a variety to keep things in. Yeah. Keep, for, for me, just to keep things, keep things different, keep things fresh. Yeah. I just I thought think, it was kind of ironic what we were talking about both, both sides of this get, you know, getting time back because you do things the same. You've had these conversations, but now we're talking about using variety and, you know, staying a step ahead of the kids and making it different and, so there's this there's this kind of dynamic where I, I suppose again, like you said, it's not a right and a wrong. It's what's your personality and where do you think you want variety and where don't you want variety? Well, I think you've got to have things in your pocket that you can pull on in case yeah. things don't work. You have a certain yeah. group that does things differently. You have, you know, um, a prime example would be um, having the kids line up and count them off. Yeah. I don't think you ever count them off in twos. Yeah, it's always four or more. Because, you know, like one of the things that I learned early on and when doing the counting thing, and I don't do it very often, but I'll do it every once in a while. Inevitably, the friends are going to always go stand next to each other. Or they're going to try to figure out, okay, he's doing, uh, so I need to be here. Yeah. So that, you know, and then I'll go, okay, so we're going threes and fours today together. And I'm usually paying attention, so I knew who moved. And so I'm intentionally breaking that group up. <laughs> but it's that concept of, you've got to be able to change it if you go sixes yeah. you know okay we're doing one threes and sixes today together i don't know why i thought of, i got to share this because you know I was, I was in the marines and uh there was a situation we had to count off by fours i forget what the what the heck we were counting off by fours it was one two three four one two you know you got a line of 75 guys count off by fours one two three four one two three four one two three four five and man, to that person that said five, he had a bad day. <laughs> that, oh, he he freaking had to dig a hole in China. <laughs> oh, he had a bad day. It's like, man, I'm glad I, I'm glad I only went to four. <laughs> oh man. Well, and, and I've had days where I do the math for the kids because it's a math lesson. So we sit down and I count them off and I put them in their groups and I go, okay, line back up. We're gonna do this again. And they're like, what do you mean? And I count them off and I tell them to go to their groups and I go line back up. And I'm like, what? And I go, how can I have one group of six and one group of three? I said, it's your choosing to yeah. ignore the directions. Yeah. I said, in a game, you don't get to choose which rules you're going to follow. So, and there's an interesting way to get to get random, random teams, you know, all right, find a partner, rock, paper, scissors. If you win the rock, paper, scissors, go to this side of the gym. If you don't yep. win the rock, paper, scissors, go to this side of the gym. So now you had all your friends bunched together yep. to get to be partners, but now I, now you just separated them. Okay, now we've got two separate teams. Okay, do it again. Find a partner. And they do it, they do it again. Okay, if you win, you go to this side of the gym. So now, now all of a sudden you have four different teams. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Use, using that rock, paper, scissors. You know, Jamie, I just like to highlight that idea for efficiency of having some preset ways to partner up either, you know, by color and on, on blue day, you have a certain partner or you have numbers, you use squads. Justin talked about his, his squads. The kids know their squads. My kids, I, I use similar types of systems where it's, it's, it's part of the system. It's set up the culture of your, your classroom is set up where they just know, and boom, you just say blue day partners and they can go having some things set up like that. Um, I, th I think it's really important for the days you really can't afford those long discussions. You just need to move kids and, and move them quickly. Any thoughts? Absolutely. I think it comes, you know, you have a half hour class, and you look at you, and you just got an email that 10 minutes in your class, you have a fire drill. So oh. you, you want to get this activity. You want to cram 30 minutes of class into 10 minutes to talk about being efficient. And just like you said, you have preset partners, you have squads. Like Justin said, he has one, two, three, four, and then A, B, C, D. So, or, or predetermined partners, but just yeah. something, a very efficient way to move kids. And I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a classroom management piece. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's fun to listen to not only Justin, but get on 
to uh, Facebook. I love the people that have responded when we put out a question. It's so helpful. I learned so much. Um, and then to get on these jam sessions and, and chat about it with other professionals. It, it, it's been helpful for me. Um, I, and I know I'm going to improve my techniques with this, even in the upcoming weeks, I'm planning on I'm implementing some of these strategies. So, um, but I kind of like to put a bow on it unless you got something else to add. No, speaking of efficiency, keep it fast and furious. All right. Yeah, I, I think as we've thought through this, we kind of came down to there's just some considerations you need to have when you're thinking about how to how to move students into groups or into specifically partners here. And number one, we talked about protecting students emotions. The second consideration you need to make is do you want to just address student emotions? And the third, you got to really think about the efficiency you need for that lesson. So really, when, when I think about it, the most important consideration is really to know why you're doing what you're doing. And that is Thinking PE. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter at Thinking PE. Find us on all your favorite podcast providers by searching Thinking PE. For more resources and videos, go to www.thinkingpe.com. Thanks for listening.